It's also National Volunteer Week, and I just want to take a moment thank everyone who has volunteered over the past week, excuse me, over the past month working in our shelters and delivering food or just giving some of their time to help people during the stay-at-home period. Also, these volunteers are unsung heroes, and we can't thank them enough for all that they're doing for us in this city and across the country. I also want to express my sincere appreciation to our police officers. I see Chief Pazin is here. Thank you, Chief. Sheriff deputies and firefighters who continue to put themselves in harm's way to support all of us right now. And as you saw on display yesterday, when they had to put themselves at risk of exposure to this virus, but they were still on post to make sure everyone was safe. And so we want to thank uh, our police officers in particular for being there yesterday. I also want to thank the healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and paramedics, and so many others who are warriors in the fight against the virus. Thank you to the Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, Public Health Investigations. Bob McDonald is here, our executive director, uh, which has been working around the clock to ensure citizens remain safe during this extremely challenging time. And finally, I want to thank the people of Denver who have done their part not to create gridlock, uh, but to support our health care workers by staying at home, practicing physical and social distancing, and taking this virus seriously. We are greatly appreciative to you, and we know that all the success we're beginning to feel and see in terms of the curve on this virus is due to your diligence commitment uh, to, to serve and to protect everyone. Um, sadly, nearly 100 people in Denver have died from this insidious virus, many of them in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. There have been about 1,750 positive cases in Denver so far, and we want to, we're thankfully on pace uh, of new, vi new cases that appear to be slowing. Our hospitals are doing a great job keeping up with demand. About 80% of all hospital beds are available. One third of ICU beds are open, and nearly two thirds of ventilators are available for use. And a number of new hospitalizations also appear uh, to be slowing. These are very encouraging signs that our efforts to stay at home and physically distance from one another are working. Now, as everyone is aware, we are coming to the potential end dates of both the Colorado Stay at Home Order on Sunday and Denver's at the end of this month. This is a critical week for Denver and the metro area. We will be in close coordination with the governor and me other metro area leadership, including public health directors, to determine whether the health care data we are seeing supports a phased relaxation of stay-at-home orders. Our team is busy planning for what lifting that order would look like here in Denver and around the metro area. We still have a lot of work to do over the next seven to 10 days. Some of our biggest challenges are significantly increasing testing for COVID-19 and then testing for antibodies, as well as retraining and hiring staff for contact tracing. Those are the two top criteria that we talked about uh, for weeks now in terms of how we can begin to loosen, loosen some of our orders here, here in the city of Denver. We're working on several scenarios to ensure this is a slow, phased, and controlled reopening. And we'll have to be a nimble, it will have to be nimble enough so that if God forbid um, we see a spike in cases and we're able to, we have to quickly reinstitute our orders. Now, I've been talking to business leaders over the last several weeks, and I believe everyone recognizes and understands that this will not be just a, a, a exercise of flipping the switch. Uh, this is going to be a gradual turning on the dimmer has been used as an example with many protective measures that have been put in place remaining in place until we have better control of the virus spread. We know our residents have questions about how long restrictions on large gatherings will be in place. And I can just be want to be very clear and candid with you. Um, we as a city should anticipate these restrictions uh, to remain in place for a while, even after uh, no longer, we are no longer to remain at home. Um, this will be a different summer for those of us uh, here in Denver, Colorado. And while we are intent on reopening public and economic life in Denver as soon as possible, public health is paramount 
and many restrictions must remain in place. Um, we oftentimes get people who are, we're all, you know, it's easy to get confused with this. There are two orders in place. One is a stay at home, uh, which will expire, set to expire April 30th here in the city of Denver. The state order says April 26th. And we also have a social distancing order that's in place and set to expire uh, May 11th. That one uh, regulates the gathering or large gatherings of uh, individuals in the city of Denver. Again, set to expire May the 11th. Later this week, we will be ex updating and extending the public health order restricting, restricting large gatherings and large events in our city. And we will have more details on that hopefully uh, by the end of this week. And again, um, we should expect as residents of this city, as visitors to Denver, that these orders will remain in place uh, for the foreseeable future um, to keep everyone safe. And we also know that people have questions about which businesses will be allowed to reopen uh, when they will be allowed to reopen and how they will be allowed to reopen. Uh, there is not a topic of conversation that is greater than that question or those questions here in the city of Denver right now. And we'll all have more information to answer to these questions in the next several days. Again, I'll pinpoint the next seven to 10 days are gonna be critical here in the life of our city. In the meantime, I wanna provide you with a few updates on this work. First, we want to remind our residents of the importance of physical distancing while in our parks. As you know, we are gonna start restricting the use of shared equipment such as fris Frisbees and footballs. Uh, we're still seeing too much of that in our parks. Uh, we wanna get you outside. We wanna get you fresh air. We want you to enjoy the sun. Uh, we understand the, the, the benefits of having sun on our faces and being able to get outdoors, uh, but we need you to stay at least six feet apart and do not gather or travel in groups. Uh, this is for all of our well-being. Uh, going forward. While those are more restrictive actions uh, we're taking, we're also loosening others. As of Wednesday, all city operated golf courses will reopen to the public, weather permitting, uh, with strict requirements. And I believe, uh, I know Happy Haynes, our executive director of Parks and Rec, is here in case there are questions, uh, but you can go to uh, the uh, www.cityofdenvergolf.com to get more information on that. And I believe the private sector golf courses have shown us a lot of uh, best practices on how we can keep people safe on the golf courses. And you'll see a lot of those uh, recommendations or at least uh, practices put in place on public golf courses. Next, I'm also proud to announce that the first $2 million or the $4 million for our businesses, our business relief fund will be going out the door today. Eric Haraga, our executive director of uh, the Division of Economic Development and Opportunities here to answer any questions you may have about that. And through our partnership with the Downtown Denver Partnership to date, we've raised more than $400 million on top of the $4 million, excuse me, $400,000 on top of the $4 million through the generous support of our local banking and insurance industries. And we wanna thank our private sector partners for coming uh, forward with their support, as well as to the Downtown Denver Partnership uh, membership. Our uh, Denver Economic Development and Opportunity will be contacting grant recipients this week and we're estimating that the first round of funding will support between 200 and 250 small businesses. Now these are businesses located around the city of Denver, many of them in neighborhoods vulnerable to displacement, and about 60% of the recipients are women and or minority owned businesses. Providing some relief to our businesses and workers is important to our planning efforts for reopening. And we're working now on the process to distribute the next round of grants uh, in May. Finally, I wanna take a moment to talk about what's happening in our nursing homes and our long-term residential care facilities. This is very important. As the governor, I believe, outlined uh, last week, uh, he noted that 40 to 50% of the more than 400 deaths in Colorado are linked to nursing homes and long care facilities. This is one of the more tragic and alarming aspects of this pandemic. My heart aches for the families of every one of the people who have died in the nursing homes and as a result of this virus around the state of Colorado and around the world. These residential care facilities are home to some of our oldest, most fragile and most vulnerable residents and we need to do more uh, to protect them. I wanna thank the governor for updating his public health order requiring these facilities to create detailed isolation plans by May 1 
and increased state support in the form of the National Guard and testing for these facilities. Denver also will be increasing uh, our oversight of and support for long care facilities. Over the last two months, we have issued all 118 facilities in Denver at least three sets of public health orders, outlining policies, procedures, and protocols to keep their patients and staff safe and healthy. Yet at, at, as of this morning, yet as of this morning, 26 of these facilities have at least two positive cases among their patients, and 49 have at least one suspected or confirmed case in staff our resident. Clearly, as a city, as a state, we need to do more. We will be reassigning DD, PHE staff to, uh, for compliance visits to as many of these facilities as possible over the next two weeks. We'll be working with them to ensure they are following physical distancing requirements, and we will continue prioritizing these facilities for additional PPE testing and staff support. I want to again issue our deepest thoughts and prayers to all family members who have been impacted by this virus. Today, we know more than 1,760 families are dealing with positive uh, cases of coronavirus in Denver. We've lost close to 100 people in the city. I don't know many families that have not been touched by this situation, either through the orders that have come or people in our families or loved ones who have been lost or who are dealing with positive cases. But know that there is nothing more important than as a city government that we are focused on than making sure that we keep all residents of the city safe and healthy. And so we really do. When I say I appreciate you staying at home, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for staying at home. Before we wrap up, one of our primary focuses during this pandemic has been the increased support for our residents experiencing homelessness. You saw last week we opened an auxiliary shelter at the National Western Complex to relieve pressure on our shelter system so our providers can provide more physical distancing in facilities. Again, I want to thank our National Guard for coming to Denver to help us with our <laughs> shelters and for their leadership and courage and they're leaning in in ways that we could never imagine, the men and women who are wearing uniforms to help us as well as to our law enforcement who are on the streets every day who are helping those most vulnerable uh, find their way and to get services. We appreciate you as well because you're also putting yourself in the line of this virus. The governor and I have both made calls to our hotels and motels to open up rooms to these residents. Um, the team has been working on securing uh, around the clock efforts to take care of our homeless. This has resulted in more than 550 rooms being secured for use currently. And I want to thank those hotels and motels, uh, motel operators for stepping up and being a part of our solution here in the city. Today, we will open a new auxiliary shelter for women at the Denver Coliseum. And I'm going to ask Britta Fisher, who is our chief housing officer for the city of Denver, to come forward and update us on that auxiliary. Britta? Thank you, Mayor. Today's opening of the Auxiliary Shelter for Women is very much a collective effort. Uh, it involves not only our city, but our provider community. We're fortunate to have a very strong network of shelters and service providers in place and want to appreciate the Homeless Leadership Council and the many members there who have been partners in this work all along. Uh, last week's snowstorm provided a slight delay in the opening of the Women's Auxiliary Shelter. We wanted to ensure a solid start to what is already a complex logistical endeavor. Um, our plans are in place and the weather is on our side today. And so we're looking forward to welcoming our first guests in a few hours. We'll be opening the doors of the Coliseum for intake at 2.30 this afternoon. What this means is that we will have room for up to 300 women and transgender individuals across the spectrum. They will have personal sleeping spaces of at least 60 square feet apiece. And there's plenty of room in the Coliseum for people to move around, have meals, and relax. Uh, the guests will also receive greater access to medical care. All the women will be screened at entry for symptoms by staff from the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, Stout Street Health Center. Testing is available for those who are medically advised to do so, and guests who are medically required to isolate will be transferred to our activated respite rooms. 
Through the Stout Street Health Center's satellite facility at the National Western Center, all guests will have access to primary health care, mental and behavioral health care. So as our first guests begin arriving this afternoon, they'll be bused from other shelter locations and walk-up access will also be provided. The hours for accessing this 24-7 shel shelter are from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in order to uh, align with our medical screening for all guests at entry. The new shelter will absorb guest capacity for some of our existing overnight emergency shelters for women. This includes Catholic Charities Women's Emergency Services Shelter, which will be suspending operations and those staff and guests will be at the uh, Coliseum. And the Dolores Project, which is reducing its number of guests served in order to provide greater distancing at their current facility. The Coliseum is a 24-7 shelter, and with this day shelter in place here, the city will be closing the day shelter that was established some weeks ago at the Glen Arm Rec Center. So that will be standing down today uh, after all of the guests have left. I just want to thank, thank again uh, the Homeless Leadership Council, the staff who have been redeployed uh, to these shelter missions, and to our National Guard who are serving such an important role at long-time existing overnight shelters and day shelters and at activated respite and protective action rooms. We're very excited that to those 550 rooms that we've already secured, we'll be adding another 138 rooms uh, this week and through our partnership with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Serving people experiencing homelessness in our community is very much a collective effort, and I thank everyone for what they've done to step up for people in our community. Thanks. Before we open a question and answer, I think it's always important to turn or hear the voices of those public health officials who we um, have a great deal of confidence in um, helping us to craft our decisions and, and these orders. And I just want to ask Bob McDonald to come up for a few seconds to, to give us a general update on Denver. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to share a couple of things. It seems like I share every week, but in my mind, that, that's actually good news. Um, every day when I come in, I look at the number of cases that we've had the previous day, the number of positive cases, and I'm uh, pleased that I'm able to continue to share with you that we are definitely seeing a stabilizing of the number of cases that we've seen in Denver. Um, I believe that our Joint Information Center will be sharing with uh, a number of uh, media outlets, with all of you, uh, some charts that we put together that show the cumulative number of cases since we began this journey, um, but also a stabilizing of the, the, the number of cases that we see every day. In those areas, when you look at those charts, you see a little blip here and there, 100 cases one day, 90 cases in another day. when. For the most part, you see around 50 to 60 or so, maybe 65 cases on average a day. Uh, when you look at those charts and you see those little blips and increase in numbers, take a look at the numbers previous to that and the number of cases following that, and you'll see that leading up to those small spikes, if you will, you see the cases were very, very low. Uh, and then just following that spike, again, cases for the next two or three days was very, very low. Um, that's that's a, a result of reporting, a delay in reporting. If you look at the number of cases on a three-day average, you see that it's very flat. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be able to keep reporting that uh, every week. Um, and then a number, uh, the other chart that will be shared with you is the number of hospitalization admissions um, in, compar in comparison to the number of beds available. And I don't have the chart in front of me right now, but there are hundreds of available beds in comparison to the number of cases that we're seeing being admitted. Those are two very important criteria uh, in terms of uh, what we look at in easing up on some of the restrictions that we have in place. But I wanna stress a couple of things here. When you look at those charts, you know, it's easy to look at that and say, well, why did we do that? You know, did, did we do it too early? too early? Did we need to do it at all? When I look at those charts, what it tells me is that we acted in time. We acted in time. That's why those numbers look the way they do, because we, we implemented those strategies in time, and now is not the time to be easing up. We want to continue to look at those numbers. I uh, still, unfortunately, see a number of people out in public uh, without face masks on or face coverings, I should say, uh, 
please continue to wear those when you can. It's strongly encouraged and it's a requirement uh, for essential businesses, for personnel and essential businesses. So please continue with those efforts. That's what's gonna keep those numbers down. And again, those criteria in terms of number of cases and hospitalizations, those are just two of a number of criteria that we'll look at in the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Get a sense of the voices uh, that um, give us the leadership and confidence to make some very, very difficult decisions in the life of our nation. Um, every day. So we're going to go ahead and open it up uh, the lines for questions. Mr. Mayor, Mayor good morning. This is Kyle Lord. Clark with Nine News. Uh, the language that you're using, the language that Governor Polis is using, suggests that lifting the state and the city's stay home orders on their end date is pretty much a done deal. Is that fair to say? No. <laughs> Um, I believe that there's still a lot of information, Kyle, that we have to receive. Um, we'll get a lot of that, uh, I think, starting today and throughout the week. Um, Bob and his team and I will huddle along with the other team here. We'll talk to the governor. we got to talk to uh, the regional leadership as well. Uh, so a lot of work has to be done. And so that's the language I want you to zero in on, is that over the next seven to ten days, we got a lot of conversations and data to, to pour over and a lot of tough decisions that have to be made. Mayor, regarding the social distancing ordinance that expires on May 11th, um, I know that covers restaurants. What could we see um, in terms of restaurants reopening? Can they reopen, but might it be at a reduced capacity? Um, and is it possible that ordinance is going to be extended? Yeah, the order will be extended. You can bet on that, um, the, how it looks going forward. Um, we're still putting that together today. Uh, I had a call last week with uh, the Restaurant Association, and I, we had, I don't know, quite a few restaurant owners and operators on the line. And I'll tell you, we were as open as possible in terms of the impact. They were as open as possible in terms of their impact and what they will be looking for. I can tell you that many of them have already started talking and thinking about and putting in place protocols for opening and uh, they wanted to share some of those with us and they will share them with us and many of those protocols I'm sure will become part of our easing into this uh, but you can bet that there will be some easing into this again we're not going to just throw open the doors of restaurants and say everybody come we've got to be smart and thoughtful about this the restaurant operators are in that same place though difficult um, they're ready to to help craft those those opportunities around protocols some restaurants may not open until they're able to fully open and so if we have a let's say a 50 percent rolling open and then we have to increase it to 75 percent some may wait until it's 80 percent or 90 percent or 100 percent because of the the uh, diminishing returns based on um, their costs related to the the percent of opening that they allow or will be allowed so there's some very you get a sense of some of the difficult decisions and calculations we have to take in place here and i know those restaurant operators at least the ones we had on the phone understand and are ready to lean in and help us to craft those commonsensical approaches. Mr. Mayor, to be able to stay in the in the new shelters at the at the, the Coliseum and at the National Western and in the hotel room. Let me have uh, Breda come up and ask the, answer that question. Can I hear that question again, Donna? How long will people be able to stay in the these new shelters at the Coliseum and National Western and in the hotel rooms in the respite room? Yeah. So. Uh, Exit strategy is something that we continue to discuss, but overall in the shelters, this is now the new site. And so there's assigned beds and people are able to get those beds in an assigned basis, first come, first serve. And uh, we'll continue to monitor all of the factors that have been discussed this morning uh, as we think about what it will take to exit some of these strategies as well. And you mentioned Hi, 550 Honor. rooms are available now. That's the city rooms, not that doesn't include the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless Room. So the rooms that we are uh, talking about, when I say 552 that are secured, uh, that includes that's inclusive of our partnership with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. As uh, with adding the 138 rooms this week, that'll bring us up to 690 in total. Okay. All right, this is Connor from Westward. Um, Happy Haynes, can we uh, get some more information about what the strict requirements are going to look like for the golf courses reopening? And uh, when should we expect City Park Golf Course to reopen? Happy Haynes, Executive Director of Denver Parks and Recreation. Thank you for the question. A couple of questions. 
Um, so there will be quite a number of um, protocols and restrictions in place for reopening golf. Uh, it includes um, uh, reserving tee times in advance uh, only by phone, so there will be no contact with our pro shops, which will be closed. Um, the guests who arrive will be uh, escorted by individuals who, uh, when they arrive at the parking lot to give them um, the uh, instructions on how to proceed through the course. Uh, they will go directly to the tee box. Uh, they will be uh, asked to uh, strictly abide by the six foot, at minimum six foot uh, physical distancing uh, requirement at all times on the course, whether on the tees, on the fairways, or on the greens. Uh, we have taken a number of steps to eliminate the sharing of any equipment on the golf course. So the flags, uh, while there, will, will uh, stay in place, so they will not be removed. Uh, the cups will be covered so that uh, as if, if your ball rolls over the, the cup, that is considered a hole out and um, moving on to the next. We've removed all of the bunker rake, rakes, um, ball washers, water coolers, anything on the course that traditionally has been used as common shared equipment. All of those will be off, um, uh, off limits. Golf, golfers are uh, not to touch anyone else's golf equipment, so no, no borrowing the, the uh, great driver that your friend may have. Um, you have to use your own equipment. That includes uh, bags, clubs, balls, tees, the pool carts. Um, we will have carts available for rent. They will be limited to one person per cart, so no sharing of the carts. And we will be... Um, uh, cleaning uh, and disinfecting all of the carts after each use. Um, the restrooms will be open. Uh, the clubhouses will be closed except for a visit uh, to the restrooms, again, following physical distancing requirements and picking up uh, food uh, that is available only for takeout. So that's a brief summary of all of the restrictions that will be in place. Uh, City Park. Happy Haynes from uh, Denver Parks and Rec, uh, making golfers happy as the weather warms that uh, the city uh, golf courses are going to be opening with restrictions that we have seen in other places as well. Uh, joining the mayor today also, we did hear from Bob McDonald from Denver uh, Public Health and Environment, and he talked about the cases in the city stabilizing. That certainly was good news. And then Britta Fisher from the, uh, the chief housing officer for the city of Denver, talking about the women's auxiliary shelter set to open in about three hours at the Coliseum, uh, capable of uh, providing housing for 300 uh, women. Uh, the mayor himself uh, made a point of letting everyone know that today is 420, but Civic Center Park is closed. He said, do not come to the park. He did talk about reopening a bit, but uh, the Denver order is going to remain in place for at least 10 days as of now to the 30th. But he talked about a slow phased, even nimble reopening of the city of Denver, but sadly also talked about nearly 100 people in Denver that have died from COVID-19, many in long term care facilities. The mayor also pointing out and thanking all of those people on the front lines, police, fire and uh, health workers. We're also expecting an update from Governor Polis. That is due to happen in about four hours at 3.30. We'll be bringing that to you live as well. We'll have the latest on everything that's going on in and around the, the state of Colorado coming up on 9 News at noon. All of what we have received has been pushed out, and so we are not stockpiling any of it. We have created a prioritized list of who gets that, starting with our hospital systems, um, our first responders, as well as long-term care facilities, other city employees, and some of the other requests that we have gotten that have come in. But the key thing with it is everything that we've gotten in, our stockpile remains at zero. As we get these shipments in, we push all of it out to those who need it most. Mayor Hancock, this is Dave Sachs with Denverite. Uh, you mentioned at the top of this press conference um, uh, testing, and I'm wondering if the city has 
a percentage in mind of how much of the population needs to be tested and tracked in order to lift the stay-at-home order. Yeah, I appreciate it. Bob McDonald's going to come and talk about that because that is a very important aspect, I'm sure, of every order in terms of loosening regulations or restrictions, I should say, around the nation. Every mayor, governor will be looking at what target are we going after in terms of testing and what, how robust will our contact tracing efforts be. And so, Bob, you want to come and give the common thoughts on that? Well, the, the answer is it depends what you read and what you look at. Um, I will tell you that based on my estimations and the population of Denver and uh, the, the uh, epi curve, I, end, I estimate that we would need to do somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 a week. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, it, it, we are building capacity with our partners uh, throughout the city, particularly in the uh, medical care setting, but we have a ways to go with that yet before we reach that, uh, that number. And will the city will, will the city lift the stay at home order without reaching that number? Uh, we'll have a conversation about that. It depends on how robust we are moving toward that number, and if the impediments to that number um, are, uh, you know, we can get over them and, and ultimately find ourselves to the place we want to be with regards to testing. And Mr. Mayor, real, real, quick, Bob, real quick, Bob, when you say that we're, we're not quite there yet, where are we at as, as far as testing? I believe the question is where are we and I don't know that I have uh, well I don't have an update today uh, I haven't looked at those numbers yet when I looked last week um, cumulative throughout, throughout the city it's it's in the hundreds um, but what continues to be a challenge is not the personnel to to manage the test it's the reagents and the equipment that's needed to do that uh, so it goes up and down uh, based on available equipment but it's uh, far short from what's needed at this time Ray Solomon, KUNC, uh, regarding those protective action rooms for people experiencing homelessness, you said that you secured 550 of those so far, but that you would need over 3,000 to, um, to cover the entire population of people experiencing homelessness. And you've also, you've, you're prepared to contract for that many. So how come, why have you not yet contracted that many protective action rooms? What are the main challenges to getting those in place? Yeah, the questions about uh, the challenges to getting the protective action rooms that we need. Um, and so we continue to work with hotels. I'm very grateful to many hotels that have um, stepped forward, thankful to the state of Colorado for their efforts and encouragement um, to hoteliers as well. Um, and what we see still as a pinch point and one of the major concerns is we still have to staff those hotels um, for this purpose, uh, whether that's security personnel, medical personnel, um, depending on uh, what the exact needs are for each facility, uh, we continue to need to work to procure the personnel as well as the rooms. We continue to work through the contracting um, terms with those hotels, but we are getting there and we're getting more steam every day and, and we're very encouraged by that. If hotels haven't stepped up to uh, offer to agree to enter contract with you, have they refused? or they just haven't stepped up? Uh, the questions about the reasons why people might not be looking to use that. Uh, some facilities, it's as simple as they want to be able to serve uh, their uh, regular guests as soon as the, uh, orders are lifted. Uh, for others, uh, there's concerns about um, housing persons experiencing homelessness. And for still others, it's uh, looking at their business models and what makes sense to them. So it's a myriad of, of reasons why some may not. But the more important thing is that I think we're um, well on our way and, and getting closer to more and more of the rooms that we do need. Can I ask about rapid testing and what the mayor has seen from his staff as far as the testing of city workers, how accurate those have been, or have there been a lot of false positives? Yeah, good question. Uh, who, Chief, you want to also talk about law enforcement on that end? Because you guys are doing a lot of that. Let's have Bob, Bob come up first and talk about it. Yeah, uh, if, uh, the question I believe was about the reliability of rapid testing, and, and I think the focus has been serology tests, not the swab tests uh, for viral load in the back of someone's throat. You know, it's, it's uh, the reliability varies. Uh, I believe right now the FDA has given uh, approval for 90 or so uh, to be marketed. That doesn't mean that the FDA has approved their reliability, but they've allowed them to be marketed. 
Uh, we have used some of those tests in the Department of Safety. Um, and you know, I've said this before when recently asked, we are learning a lot about this virus. And, and if we can get a hold of some tests that inform us on what we're dealing with and in a way that we can make more targeted decisions, uh, I think as a city, we've done that. We've stepped out in front of this. We're gonna take advantage of every opportunity we can uh, to include those tests that the FDA has allowed retailers to push out uh, for, um, uh, for the purposes that we're using here in Denver. So I can't speak to the reliability of all of the 90 or so uh, tests that are available, um, but the Department of Safety has been very proactive in using them responsive, uh, responsible, in a responsible manner and then following up with swab tests every time they get a positive serology test. Can you say how accurate they've been in Denver, though, the A2 bioscience test? Sorry, can you repeat that? Can Bob share how accurate they've been in Denver, the A2 bioscience test? Yeah, the, the ones that have been used in the Department of Safety are have been verified, uh, again, through confirmation of the, the serology test, over 90%. Okay, last question, please. Any more questions? This yeah, is Lori Lizarraga no. with Nine News. I, I have a question about testing as well. I know that National Jewish Health in Denver has come up with its own test so that it's not reliant on the supplies and therefore isn't affected by the supply shortage of the reagents and so on. Is Denver looking into doing something like that so that we're not feeling the supply shortage so much? Uh, Denver's looking into everything. Uh, we're, we're, we're working with uh, medical uh, care community. We're working with uh, private entities that have um, testing uh, capabilities that they want to share with us. We're having conversations almost daily uh, with many uh, companies that provide those tests, and we evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis. But we're going to look at everything we can uh, to learn what we can every step of the way so that our decisions are targeted and thoughtful. All right, thank you very much.